Welcome everyone to this session that forms part of Renew's newly expanded Sustainable House Day program. My name is Anna Cumming and I will be your MC tonight for a discussion on the fundamentals of low energy home design. It's the second of four in our Sustainable Design 101 series in which we're getting back to basics to help equip more people with the knowledge and confidence to build or renovate sustainably. In the first session last week, we looked at what sustainable design is anyway and where to start. If you missed it, the recording is now available to view on our YouTube channel. We have people tuned in from all over the country today from a wide variety of different traditional lands. I'm speaking from the, from the traditional country of the Jar Jar Wurrung people in central Victoria, and I acknowledge them as the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So I am the editor of Sanctuary Modern Green Homes magazine, published by Renew, the organiser of Sustainable House Day. I have a long-standing interest in sustainable, energy efficient and comfortable homes that tread lightly on the earth. And I really love being part of the mission to inspire and educate people about the design strategies, materials and systems available to achieve them. In Sanctuary, we try to cover all bases, providing deep dives into sustainable design topics without assuming too much knowledge on the part of our readers. In this session though, we'll be sticking with the fundamentals, exploring passive heating and cooling, orientation, glazing, shading, thermal mass, insulation, and more. If some of those terms don't uh, mean much to you yet, then hopefully by the end of the session, you'll be a lot more across them. I'm joined tonight by an excellent panel of architects and building designers who bring wide ranging knowledge and a ton of experience between them. Firstly, we have Simone Schenkel, a certified passive house designer whose mission is to make energy efficient homes a staple in the Australian landscape. She has used the passion, experience and knowledge she gained from her upbringing and architectural studies in Germany to create Gruen Eco Design, a business where she works with her clients to create not only beautifully designed homes, but also homes that are healthy, thermally comfortable, energy efficient and resilient for future generations. Hey Simone, thanks for joining us tonight. Next, yeah, up great, we have, great to be here. <laughs> next up, we have Dick Clark, proprietor of EnviroTecture, a sustainable building design firm based in Sydney. Dick is a building designer with over 30 years of experience. He was instrumental in the creation of Your Home, the government's indispensable guide to environmentally sustainable homes, and he's also a regular contributor to Sanctuary. Hi, Dick. And uh, finally tonight, we're joined by Sarah Lebner, who took out the Australian Institute of Architects National Emerging Architect Prize back in 2020. And until this year, Sarah worked in Canberra as the principal architect at Lighthouse Architecture and Science. Here she worked under nationally recognised building scientist and good friend of Sanctuary, Jenny Edwards, and they focused together on achieving high levels of energy efficiency while studying affordability and buildability. Sarah has recently returned to her family farm in Tuma in New South Wales to focus on providing expert sustainable design services to regional people and communities. Hey, Sarah. Hi, thanks, Anna. Okay, let's get started. So during our discussion tonight, I'll be putting viewers questions to our panel. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions during the registration process. You can also put questions into Zoom's Q&A window at the bottom of your screen as we go and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the time we have available tonight. You can also use the chat window to make general comments or to contact our behind the scenes team with any problems. Sustainable House Day is generously sponsored by Natas, Design for Place, Your Home, the Department of, Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, Sonnen and Lighthouse Architecture and Science, and we thank them all for their support. And just to let you all know that this session is being recorded. Okay, that's the housekeeping out of the way. Tell me, panellists, why is low energy design important? Why, why isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> How could it not be? How could it not be, exactly? <clears throat> Give us some reasons why it's something that everybody should be prioritising. Well, building we've, we've, we've got a, a federal government now who uh, plotted some kind of a path towards uh, a net zero future and so buildings have got a huge part to play in that being about 40 percent of the problem mm -hmm. so yeah, combating, combating climate change 
Yep. Yep. And and definitely, I think no one should need to choose whether being warm and comfortable or being able to pay your food bills. So I think, you know, it, it should be a right that you can live in a comfortable house that doesn't make you sick. I think, you know, it's something we have to work towards as well. Yeah. So a really important feature is that a low energy home has lower bills. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot to um, love. A lot of great things go hand in hand with a low energy home. And uh, I think it's really important that whenever we're looking at these sustainable solutions, they have to be solutions that are enjoyable to live in and make our lives better. Because also, if they're not doing those things, we won't be motivated to pursue them. So if they do go hand in hand, and there's lots we can do to ensure that they that they could even more so go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. So, um, we need energy to be motivated. So while the homes may use low energy, they might give us high energy. Via being lovely to live in and provide delight and inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point, Dick. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's for me, it's all about making houses more livable and comfortable, um, which will in turn, as Sarah alluded to, it, it will ensure that the houses themselves have the longest lifespan possible, which leads to, you know, reduced material waste and, and so forth as well. So that's, I think that's a key, key part of it too, as well as reducing the energy bills. What are the fundamental features of a low energy design building? It's sort of there's three categories, um, three steps for me. So the first thing is you're getting, getting the design right so that the, the design creates a house that needs the least amount of energy to heat and cool. So that's both the layout design, but also the materials you're choosing. The second part that we often don't talk about so much is making sure that you're reducing the house to um, to, to what you can practically and, and to meet your goals and values. Uh, because if a house is energy efficient, it doesn't, if, it, if it's huge, it's still going to use more energy and more materials. And then the third one is to think about the things that we're plugging into the house. Um, so there's the efficiency of the house on itself, that shell, um, but then there's also all of the things that we plug in, hot water, heating, cooling, um, cooking, and how do they run efficiently. And, and even this little thing, you know, people having this old second or third fridge standing in the garage that might need as much power as your entire household, you know, even those little things can, can come into play as well. Uh, let's unpack some of what Sarah just mentioned in the kind of design for, um, for for low energy, design for efficiency section of your answer there, Sarah. Um, and let's 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 dig into yeah all the components that go towards um, the low energy design of a house, starting with um, I don't know where do we want to start orientation, solar access. Yep. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Maybe Dick, you haven't. Yeah, I mean, look, getting the lines in, on the page in the right place costs nothing. And, mm. and so getting a, a site responsive design where we're looking for um, free winter heat in, in the cooler climates or, you know, where I am at the moment up in Cairns and Top End, you know, you, you're really looking for, for good shading orientation. And, and so where the house sits in Australia and where it sits in altitude and where it sits in terms of local topography will tell you all of those things. Yeah, so it really depends on your local climate zone, um, exactly how to how is best to interpret um, the, the orientation and solar access. Is mm. that right? Yeah. Depending on where you are in Australia, for real beginners, some people still don't realise this, um, the sun changes angles during the year as it tracks across <laughs> the sky. And that's what we're really talking about with um, designing for the sun you can harness that amazing free heating to heat your house it's very powerful but at the same time hand in hand you can design it so that it's fully shaded in summer um, and, and that's what you're aiming to do in a cool and temperate climate and then in a hotter climate you're you're obviously increasing the shade factor yeah, yeah and I guess so that, that the important thing as well is you know we're all here today because we, we know this, but most people probably wouldn't know that, you know, energy efficiency can't be an afterthought, you know. When you start designing, it has to be the first thing you look at, you know, where's my sun coming from? How can I get as much sun into the house and window? Or how do I keep it out in summer? Uh, it just can't be an afterthought. It has to be brought right at the start of your designing your home. I often Absolutely. say ignoring it is like choosing to park your car in the sun for the rest of your life. <laughs> 
good. <laughs> yeah, and it's so easy to do at the beginning of the design process, and it's so hard to do later. To, to so hard to fix later. Yeah. Um, so put your in, in temperate in temperate climates. That's all about putting your living areas on the north side of your house as much as possible. Making um, you know putting lots of glazing on the north side to catch that that northern sun in the winter, the lower northern sun, as you explained, Sarah, the sun changes angle during the year, and then um, pair that with eaves or other shading to keep the summer sun out. So that's yeah. that's the sort of, that's um, that's orientation and solar access 101. <laughs> yeah, without going into too much detail, you also have to be careful that you don't overshadow yourself. Like, you know, many people, they have those, you know, big frescoes or something at the northern side, and then suddenly you could create your own shadow. So, you know, you have your, your roofing over the alfresco that, that shadows your windows. You actually don't get the sun in or you have an L-shaped building where you keep the sun out or the, you have neighbors or trees. So all those things have to be taken into account as well. Mm. And another yeah. beginner's mistake, sorry, Dick, another beginner's mistake um, that I'll add to that is assuming that the sort of an unlimited amount of glazing you can have on that northern side, that the more the merrier. Even good quality windows still transfer heat a lot faster than a, a standard insulated brick wall. So there is an optimal point that you can get to. What were you going to say, Dick? Oh, just that the, um, I still see a lot of sort of classic Aussie homestead uh, buildings being mm. built with the, the big wide veranda all around that, that yes. um, you know, completely kills the winter solar access in the cooler climates. Yeah, that's all. That's that's perfect for for warmer environments um, when paired with, you know, great cross ventilation, but not great for temperate, yep. temperate climates. Yep. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about passive heating and cooling. Um, solar access is, of course, part of the, a key part of it. What else is? What else should be should people be aware of? Um, so passive heating and cooling is all about. Um, designing your house so that you can heat it or it can heat and cool itself without using um, mechanical systems like air conditioners and heaters, right? Mm. So can we talk a little bit more about Yep, I guess the, the important that. thing is to control the sun coming into your house. So obviously in winter we want it inside, but in, in summer we have to keep it out. So you have to think about, you know, how can I do this? So on the northern side, for instance, eaves can work quite well. You know, you have to make and you can actually calculate it. You know, there are angles on what, what angle the sun is coming in summer. And so you can try a lot, okay, how long does the eve have to be in order to keep the summer sun out? But on the western side, for instance, that's where it gets tricky because the low, um, the low uh, sun in summer can come really, really low. So no amount of eve can help you with that. So one easy trick is to avoid, you know, glazing as much as you can on the western side. But, you know, obviously sometimes it doesn't work if you have your views or your garden to the west. So you might have to come up with some other inventive options like, you know, that's potentially the point where you can put your alfresco, you know, on the western side. But then again, you know, you might have a three meter wide alfresco, but it's the deep, you know, uh, the lower summer sun might still come in. So you might need some vertical blinds or something to help you in summer. So there are some things to help you. Um, yeah, that's and just to a shading as well on that exactly. great list. Mm. And yeah, active shading that, that can be operated. So you can choose, especially in spring in, in, in cool and temperate climates where spring tends to be this kind of daily war between winter and summer. You know, one day is summer and then the next day is winter and then a couple of days later it's summer again and, and so it goes. And so having shading that you can quickly and easily move in response to those changes can make a lot of sense as well. Mm. And Dick used a great word there, operable, which we often don't associate with houses anymore. Um, there's a local architect in Canberra who speaks about houses being ships that need to be sailed. And I love that because that's um, a big part of getting the most out of your home. And um, I guess to kick off the active operation of a solar passive home, um, you're looking to open the house up when it's cooler at night, ventilate the house out, cool it down. And then as soon as it's starting to warm up outside, you actually close the house. And so many people make the stake of, you know, it's a coolish morning and they leave the house open and it's sort of a nice temperature, but then it starts to get a bit hot and sticky, say at like 11 o'clock in the morning, then they close the house down. It's too late by then. You've already sort of let the house warm up quite a bit. So that um, capture and control of um, breezes and temperature when you want them can really work to your advantage. 
Yeah, there's an old so saying that passive houses need active users. Yeah, but not to a not to an onerous degree, I don't think, and uh, um, no. and not if they're well designed. And, and, and it gets complicated. I know there's a question in the chat already about passive house. It gets complicated with passive house because you probably need less um, intervention type activity in a passive house than you do in a passive solar house. But we'll probably get to that shortly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's and, just and let's it's just tricky if you're working the, together. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just introduce passive house right now because I, I do want to kind of talk about them both in parallel. Um, mm -hmm. So passive solar design is what we've been talking about so far where, where it's really important to have great, the, you know, correct orientation, solar access to enable passive heating. Passive house with a capital P, capital H is a, is a different thing, slightly different thing. There's definitely overlaps. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a different approach to achieving a low energy um, home and mm -hmm. Dick and Simone both um, work in this space. So perhaps could we have Passive House 101 very briefly, please, guys? <laughs> I guess maybe the one big thing to say, Passive House uh, isn't, it doesn't mean it's just for houses. It's not just residential. It, it's just the German word Passive House means dwelling. So it's it's a, a voluntary but rigorous standard to build highly energy efficient, uh, comfortable homes. So versus with uh, passive solar, a lot is is done with you know trial and error over the years. You know how things work, and you can calculate some things with energy weighting programs, but there is still quite a bit up to interpretation. But say that the biggest problem with them how energy weightings are done in Australia is that they're um, they're they're just theoretical. So, so they're done on paper, but there's not really followed through during the construction. Versus with the passive force standard, there are really strict and quite complicated calculations. It's all about building physics. Uh, and everything is calculated up to the point, and then it's actually checked during construction. So for once, you know, details are checked by a, by a certifier, but there's also a blower door test that looks at if the house is really airtight. So the, the one big yep. difference probably between passive solar and passive house is uh, the, the, you know, on, on top of the, the good orientation or, or good windows and things and good insulation is the, the mechanical ventilation system and that there's the more emphasis on, on, yeah, on thermal comfort. Which does yeah. mean that, um, which does mean that there, it, it's it's possible to take the emphasis slightly off the orientation and solar access. Yeah. Although it's still great to consider that if you can, yeah. right? So, so sometimes so passive house can be a good solution for an area for a, a site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. But you know, a site I, I would... that doesn't have good good orientation, just doesn't have just doesn't have good solar access, then passive yeah. house can and, be a good. And the solution. other the other aspect is that because of the HRV and the requirements of passive house for monitoring humidity and temperature, you know that you are getting fresh air, you know that you're not getting high CO2 build up in bedrooms overnight during winter and, and so on. And that just makes for a much healthier outcome apart from the low energy. Yeah. And the thing is, even you now when I studied architecture in Germany, our um, building physics professor, he was quite strict. And he kept saying, ah, you know, you have to ventilate your house two or three times a day for 15 minutes cross ventilation. And by that he means, you know, open windows or doors opposite side of the house and leave them open for 15 minutes. But in all honesty, if it's 10 degrees outside or if it's 30 outside, no one does it. But the no problem is the humidity yeah. is the humidity is always there, not just if, if you know when the weather is nice. And the the, the problem with mold and humidity is it's really silent. You know, it, you don't see it. And often mold can only happen after five, six, or seven years. It builds up and it slowly happens inside the walls or inside the ceiling. And by the time it comes out, it's it's usually too late. And that's the issue which you sometimes, you know, don't know with a passive solar design. You know, if, if you're really good and you ventilate constantly, you're fine. But sadly, most people don't do it. And the, the more high performing our houses get and the more airtight they get, some of them accidentally, the higher the risk is that you could trap the humidity inside and you actually can lead, yeah, can lead to, to more. Yeah, condensation and condensation and humidity is really becoming a, a much bigger deal. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. these days isn't it as we do yeah. as we do most some of us start to build more airtight houses even if not to the to the uh, you know passive house level of, mm. of airtightness so I that's definitely that touches, something to do and talk to your designer about yeah I think that touches on a really important point I don't think we have to um, project this idea that solar passive and passive house are these binary um, opposing things um, you know, maybe we thought they were a, a, a while ago, but um, yeah. I think as it was touched on in the first session, any um, passive house designer worth their weight should be talking to you and understanding solar passive design. And similarly, I would argue that um, 
any leading um, solar passive energy efficient designer, which I would consider more myself, should understand those bu building physics things. Um, and I, uh, you know, I would still certainly prioritize um, yeah. a low air leakage rate, um, definitely understanding and addressing those condensation issues that Simone spoke about. Yeah. Um, while not using the the passive house standard so much, so there's there's, there's great knowledge across both. And um, the only yeah. only thing I would just add is that the 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 theory that the alternate modelling is based on both you know modelling systems um, have have positive great data behind them. Um, the one Simone was talking about was the NatHers. Um, system, which is great, is based on 30 years of um, Bureau of Meteorology data across 69 um, climate zones across Australia. So it's still really fantastic data. And then you can still choose to do some of those as built testing, such as yeah. the air leakage, um, which is obviously what the, the Passive House aims to get to uh, that very um, tight level. Mm -hmm. I think the big elephant in Australia is that there's just no compliance checks, you know, and the energy rating on NEFAS is it's all really good. But the problem is that at the moment in Australia, no one is responsible to check the energy efficiency of a home. So, so neither the designer, architect, builder, nor building surveyor, no one really checks us. And, and that's then where it goes a little bit back to the to the owner, you know, to to you to the people listening in here. You know, if you build a home, make sure that it's checked, you know, that that for instance, if the electrician is is putting in cable, that they, they don't pull out the insulation and things like this. So it needs to be a bit emphasis on it because even most insulation companies or most builders don't know what they're doing in this regard, as sad as it is. It is possible to write that into your contract. Yes. I, I guess uh, the only concern I have is that with the, the classic passive solar approach, as we are increasingly building more airtight buildings that we have no certainty, no way of accurately working out what the indoor air quality Air, rates of air exchange are going to be if people do not become active users and and what we've found over the years is that people tend to be lazy and uh, I guess coupled with the, the fact that air conditioning is is pretty much ubiquitous now and and to be fair it's kind of hard not to have air con to at least clip off those 45 degree peak days if nothing else but once people have it, they tend to rely on us. And most people would assume that a plastic Fujitsu box, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned a name, um, a plastic <laughs> box on the wall that might have, might or might not have been sold by a famous cricketer um, is going to be giving them fresh air, and it's not. Uh, and, and so if they don't have some kind of air management system, then they can be headed for trouble. And the mold growth index, as someone said, is going to build up over time. So we're increasingly putting... HIV systems into our classic passive solar designs as well, simply because people want to know that their bedrooms aren't going to build up with CO2 overnight. So an HRV is a heat recovery ventilation system for people who are trying to decode the acronyms. Sorry so it's that. a yeah, it's, it's a ventilation system that also known as mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, MR, M, whatever that is, MR, MV, HR. Um, it's a ventilation system that draws fresh air from outside but has the benefit of um, extracting heat from the exhaust air and transferring it to the incoming air so that you don't lose heat energy um, or cool energy <laughs> from the inside of your house through that ventilation process. So that's the advantage that it has over opening a window. Yeah. Hold on. But like like yeah. you said, Dick, for most of our projects, even the ones that don't go for passive house, we, we try to put it at, at least the ventilation. But what we're starting now is that someone really insists, oh, you know, we're ventilating enough and, you know, we don't need it, that we highly encourage them at least put proper sensors in the house, you know, that you can have sensors in the house that would at least alarm you, you know, the CO2 is too high or you have too much humidity inside the house, at least then they're aware, you know, something isn't going right because otherwise, you know, you might get problems over, the, over time. Yeah, so they I have been wondering if you if you do that anyway, because um, is there a way to know if the heat recovery system isn't working for some reason? I've often wondered. Mm, good That's uh, another reason for putting sensors in. Um, yeah. and there are <laughs> a, a couple of relatively inexpensive sensors um, which can be put in. You don't need one in every room because mm. if it's not working, it'll be not working everywhere. So yeah, that's that's quite a good idea. Yeah. So let's um let's let's duck out of this 
rabbit hole a little now <laughs> and get back to the get back to the more, yeah <laughs> climb back up again and get back to the more more towards the basics of ventilation and passive cooling we've touched on passive heating a little let's get back to the 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 basics of passive cooling ventilation um how how does how what do people need to think about um for when they're designing their their low energy house to make the most of ventilation so that they can avoid um air conditioning <coughs> as much as possible well, cross ventilation is great. You don't have to get it perfect. You just need some kind of path through the house and then good old ceiling fans. Like I'm just shocked at all our new homes where it's not even considered. Uh, a ceiling fan gives you a, um, the perception of a three degree um, temperature change on your body, which is probably more significant than you think. Um, but it also has the benefit of helping with that um, ventilation and moving air around. So that, that would be my um, starting tip. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I, I've often said, and, and Anna's going to roll her eyes at this, if I change my surname from Clark to Tater, think about it, <laughs> then ceiling fans would be mandatory everywhere all the time. But also, more importantly, people with air conditioning would not be able to run their air con unless their ceiling fans were running first. And this is something we design in where we actually make the air con circuit, the power circuit, slave ah. to the ceiling fan circuit. So you cannot turn the aircon on and make sure ceiling fans are running first. Makes it Love cool. it. That's when it's <laughs> and that's because? Uh, oh, because uh, ceiling fans will in, improve or in, increase the efficacy, love that word too, of aircon by a factor four. So this is something we, we figured out in, in the top end in Darwin in, in the early 90s, mm. um, that people up there were who, who were um, cost conscious with the, the power bills in Darwin, which has not never been cheap, uh, and so they would turn their ceiling fans on in, in uh, sort of November, October, November. Uh, and then they'd turn and they'd let them run just all the time, whether they're home or not, because they use so little energy. But then they'd turn their air con on and off as needed. And we kind of went, that's a weird thing to do. Why, why do you do it that way around? They said, well, because the air con, the, the ceiling fans cost nothing to run. Mm -hmm. And the air con is so much more effective if it's being thrown at you by a ceiling fan. And I went through at you. Okay, so it's about velocity. That kind of just amplifies the moving air factor of the um yeah of the exactly. air con blowing at you. Yeah. yeah, exactly what Sarah said. And like you said, Sarah, you know, if it's twenty-seven degrees in your bedroom, you might not be able to sleep. But if it feels like twenty-four, you know, you probably can sleep. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a big difference. Yeah, and um, for heating as well. Uh, so when when it's winter and your heater's on. Um, ceiling fans that are reversible and set on a low setting so that you don't have too much moving air cooling you down um, can really help push the heating the hot air from the heating down from your ceiling as well down to where mm. you are yeah I'd, I'd love to see more study into this because I'm a little bit I have sort of some questions about that because if the moving air um, you know gives you that three day de three degree difference in factor I'd um I, I think that's, that's why I've grown up hearing that theory, yeah. but the, I do wonder the about the reality. Three degrees, as I understand it, the, from what I, the data I've seen is you get three degrees of cooling for every half a metre of half a metre per second of wind speed over your skin. And and a ceiling fan on low, when you're somewhere within the, the draft space, gives you about half a metre. You turn it up to speed two, speed three, you know, you can get up to one and a half metres a second. So you can actually get up to eight or nine degrees of apparent cooling, mm. but you, you may not be able to hold the newspaper, you know. <laughs> yeah. Whereas yeah. Uh, the ceiling fan in reverse on the lowest speed, because that column of air is then diffused through the whole space, the velocity when it comes back down to you is actually really, really low. But what it's done is de-stratified the, cool, uh, the warm air. So it's not all sort of gathered up at ceiling level. But mm. I, I agree. It'd be love to see. Yeah, yeah it'd be good to, to see some more. I'm renting a farmhouse with stupidly high ceilings and fans at the moment, so I'll test it next winter. Yeah, test it in, <laughs> test it in winter. <laughs> um, okay, getting back out of the, climbing back out of that particular rabbit hole. <laughs> um, what's the next thing that we need to talk about? Oh, so just um, to, to add a little bit more detail to the cross-ventilation um, story, a way to do that is to, well, in my understanding is that in most climates in Australia, the prevailing or certainly in temperate zones, the prevailing breezes are often from the south um, somewhere. And having smaller window openings on the south 
um, and larger ones on the north with, with ventilation paths. So that's internal doorways or corridors that aren't going to block the, block the ventilation, um, pulls the air through the house, cooling as you go, is that right? Yeah, that's it's a it's a weird thing. It seems counterintuitive, and and it is, the physics is right. The perception is often different to that, and mm -hmm. and what we've found is that um, if people do have some sort of a view to the south, and they open all their doors, you know, that, that maximise their openings um, in that direction, they get the perception that they're kind of sitting outside in the breeze more, but the actual temperature in the building isn't any cooler yeah right <laughs> that's a really interesting point to design for perceived temperature as opposed to actual air temperature isn't it yeah, yeah. and i think on the flip side in when it's in winter when it's when it's cold and you you want to be warm inside um this is where draft proofing and fo focusing on air tightness is really key because um uh, an ambient air temperature several degrees cooler is very comfortable if you don't have drafts mm. blowing past you. And if you yeah. do have drafts blowing, blowing, blowing past you, then that that whatever that air temperature is feels really mm. cold. Yeah. And, and that's probably the, the sorry the, the, the effect that most people in, in the colder climates feel in winter. You know, you have your uh, ducted heating or your split system blowing all the time. You have hot if, uh, air in your face, but you're still there sitting shivering. You know, no matter mm. how warm it is, you never get cold. And that's yeah. the draft. You know, the surfaces in your room are cold. The uh, cold air is coming through the windows. And no matter how much you heat, you will never feel comfortable. Yeah. Because yeah. if you start, you know, fixing those leaks and the air gaps and everything, and then suddenly you, you stop shivering and you might not need your Udi and your, you know, Akwoods anymore. So, you know, that's that's where you want to get to. Mm. Uh, yeah. the, the, physi the physiology of comfort, it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. But, but you know, we have the, the core of our body and, and our temples uh, are very, very um, what's the word, perceptive of radiant heat. And, and radiant heat will warm us up regardless, almost regardless of what the, the surrounding ambient air temperature may be. And, and for people who, you know, grow up in, in cold climates like Melbourne or central Victoria like Woodend or um, the snow country, you know, it, it might be zero degrees air temperature or two degrees air temperature. But if you get into the sun mm. and out of the wind, so reduce the draft, get into the radiant heat, suddenly you feel like, oh, this is actually quite comfortable. I can deal with this. Yeah. But you walk around the corner into the shade and you go, no, not, not, not staying here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, let's talk about insulation, seeing as we're on the, you know, warmth um, topic right now. Um, how important is insulation in a low energy house and what are the different types that people should be considering and how, like, what's the priority order for tackling insulation? I guess, you know, a, a priority is ideally, you know, if you can insulate your entire house and, you know, look at it as a continuous shell because every little gap in the house, you know, will let air in, you know, cold air in or hot air in. But having said that, you know, often people are overwhelmed, you know, you can't afford it all, you don't even know where to start. So every little bit counts, you know, even if you, let's say, you know, start with the ceiling, which is typically the easiest for most people. The floors are, you know, in many instances easy if you have easy access underneath the floor. And then as next you would start the walls, but sometimes one or the other can be cost prohibitive or just very difficult or you can't have access. And, and what I always say, you know, don't be discouraged, um, even if you can't do it all, you know, every little bit that you do counts. And what are the key, um, what are the, the really important things to, to do or to, to, to be conscious of when you're, when you're putting in insulation or when you're specifying insulation, aside from just lots of it? Yeah, add, adding on to, uh, well, lots of it there. Lots again, it. there are those diminishing returns. Yeah, um, <laughs> just to, to keep mentioning that. Um, so, for example, the houses we've been doing in Canberra, we're typically looking at like an R5 bat in the ceiling, trying to get 2.5 in your walls. As Simone says, if you're retrofitting, sometimes it's hard. You might be able to pump in there. Um, and then uh, under underfloor varies hugely. You might be on a concrete slab that you can't even get access to. Um, mm -hmm. But the the key thing is when you're doing insulating is to avoid gaps because just five percent gaps in your insulation cover gives you fifty percent lost effectiveness. So you can imagine if you're working in a ceiling with older down lights that you can't cover over, or perhaps ducted heating systems, that that's instantly your five percent easily more. So. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, switch those down lights over to the rated ones that you can insulate over. Make sure there's that nice um, coverage in particular your ceilings and walls makes a, makes your product work mm. a lot harder for you. Yep. And every time anybody gets up there to do anything for you, make sure that they replace the insulation because mm. plenty of tradies are not very good at doing that. Um, Sarah was just talking about R values. That's a, that's a, a measure of the insulative value of insulation. Um, the higher the number, the more insulative it is. And yeah, like, like Sarah said, 2.5 is pretty standard in walls and you should be aiming for anything from four to six-ish or so yeah. in the ceiling. And it's, that does depend on your climate zone, right? It's insulation yeah. is less of a thing in in tropical. Um, yeah, but I would just put a little warning out. You know, whatever it says in the construction code, you know, Australian construction, it's just a minimum standard. So you know, yeah. never just use that because often many builders say, ah, you don't need much more. You know, that, that's that's all fine. You know, there's no point in doing more. You know, if if a builder or someone else talks tries to talk you into that, you know, better maybe turn one and one or at least get someone else who supports you because you should always put in more than the minimum standard. The minimum standard is really just the absolute legal minimum to not get the builder into jail. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> try to, to do better. Yeah, that's right. And the other thing when, when talking to suppliers or um, whoever about our values, and this applies to glazing too, which we will come to, I guess, uh, is just to say, okay, well, if we're looking for say 22 to 24 as an internal temperature, and outside gets down to two, four degrees, whatever, that's a 20 degree difference over how many hours of the year? And if you do a quick calculation, you know, in, in, in Southern Victoria, it's going to be hundreds of hours every year when you've got that kind of Delta T, the difference in temperature from inside to outside of 20 degrees or more. And, but even, you know, up here where I am at the moment, we've had days consistently now around 30 degrees. Now that sounds lovely, but, a, a wall or a roof sitting in 30 degree direct sun actually accumulates heat and starts re-radiating heat often at 60 degrees into the building. And so you're talking about still needing a very high R value to stop that kind of 40 plus degree temperature difference from inside to outside. The other way. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, it, it's it's all about the temperature difference. Especially if it doesn't it doesn't noticeably cool down overnight. So you can't, you know, um purge the hot air overnight and start again from a lower lower starting point the next day. Um, okay, anyone got anything more to say about insulation? Yeah, I do. Yep, go <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, the other thing is if, if you're designing a, a new building or a renovation is to really watch out for thermal bridging and, and especially oh, yeah. when, go, when, when we're doing passive house, we've really got to go to the nth degree on that. But but even without going to the nth degree, just to think about, you know, a, a typical engineering solution around a big window and door might be to have a big steel beam, steel columns at the end. And and quite often the, the kind of post-industrial trendy look is to, you know, treat that with some kind of dark charcoal paint and, and just to leave it exposed inside and out. And yet, you know, might we hopefully people would say, oh well, but double glaze underneath that but but here's this huge beam just acting as a a radiator inside or outside depending on the season sitting so above what's thermal bridging do? thermal bridging is is just a uh, literally what it sounds like it's a bridge from from inside to outside so whatever temperature we're trying to get inside it's just running away to the outside world or vice versa the opposite of insulation and let's yeah. not forget there's still plenty of people that build houses with steel frames which is, yes. you know, a complete framing system of thermal bridging. <laughs> yeah, Indeed. which unless you really pay very conscious attention to mm. in, in, including some thermal bridges for your entire frame is going to it's going to conduct heat where you don't want it, basically. That's what a thermal yeah. bridge is. Yeah. is yeah. And I think people have to be careful because lots of builders, uh, they they came up with, uh, because timber is in high demand or got expensive. So they, I have many stories where they went to clients and said, ah, oh, look, you're getting an upgrade. You're getting a steel frame now, much better quality and da, da, da. So, you know, don't be fooled. Uh, ideally stay away from steel framing. Yeah, so, you've got to jump through a lot of hoops with thermal brakes to, to break that bridge. You know, which would, well, most builders would not even know about what it is. So. Yeah, yeah so hopefully. thermal break is the opposite of a thermal mm. bridge. Yeah, so that's a, that's some kind of material that, doesn't conduct heat. I'm, yeah. I'm getting this image of a bridge across the Crimea at the moment, but we probably oh. got <laughs> slightly different, but yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, thanks for bringing up the, the thermal bridge stick because, I mean, uh, even, even timber, timber framing is more of a thermal bridge than the insulated part of your wall. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's just good to be aware of that when you're, when you're building and designing. Uh, and we also talk about thermal bre thermal breaks when we talk about window frames, uh, because that's another place, that's another area where heat can be conducted quite easily, especially aluminium frames, aluminium or steel window frames. So, which leads me beautifully into the next <coughs> subject that I wanted to pick your brains about, which is window design. Mm -hmm. Like how how important is and and how should people be thinking about window design location? size glazing type frame type performance that kind of thing how 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 does that fit into low energy building? so important a big subject we probably could talk in and hey yeah i know <laughs> yeah perhaps we should have had a women hour on windows uh, <laughs> look that you know, your windows are such a big <laughs> investment so if you're doing a new home it is really worth investing um uh, whatever whatever you can in them um i did a little um case study today with some numbers on our social media um, to demonstrate how much the cost of thermally broken double glazing has come down. So to start with the 101, most people understand single and double glazing, one piece of glass, two pieces of glass, um, which improves the performance of the window. But for years, we've been ignoring that then we're framing them with this, you know, uh, aluminium the whole way around. And that really adds up over your house. And aluminium is really very conductive. Um, so it makes a, another very big difference to your home's performance if you can thermally break the window. In the little case study house I posted today, we estimated it was going to be about a $10,000 difference over 20 years in their heating and cooling bills. Um, and that was from last wow. year's <laughs> projections on energy prices. So I'm sure that would have gone through the roof now. Compared to um, the price of um, your thermally broken options has really come down. So you can either look at um, timber is automatically thermally broken. You can look at UPVC and you can also get thermally broken aluminium, which has a little piece in the middle of the frame. So they look like normal aluminium windows, but they have a, a, a little Plastic insulative or or bit like in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that little case study today really demonstrated that, yes, they still cost a bit more um, than, you, than your standard aluminium. But when you consider that $10,000 saving, they are getting very competitive. I think a lot of people think that if they're getting, you know, windows with thin frames that there's, you know, that's neg negligible. It's not going to be a, a significant area of aluminium. But once you add up the the area of each of those skinny little frames around four sides of every window in your house, it's actually a reasonable wall area. <laughs> yeah. so, and, and if you, you look at the actual performance of a windows, it's something like a, a unfirmly poking aluminium double clay. So the, the typical aluminium double glazed windows yeah. perform as bad as a single glaze timber window. But you know, okay. no one would, would yeah. put a single glazed timber window in anymore because they know I we have to go double glazing. Yeah. But then people spend actually quite a lot of money to do double glazed just to put in something quite as bad, which is a bit of a shame, I think. Mm. Plus, uh, an aluminium frame actually has an effect on the glass immediately around the frame as well. So it's it 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 kind of you know it, it's an evil thing that that affects the things around it as well. And and the other beauty <laughs> of the thermally broken aluminium frames is you can have a different colour on the inside from the outside. So you can have you know pink on the outside and purple on the inside if you want it. Um, <laughs> you know, nice touch. But the thing with it windows, match your glasses nicely, Dick. <laughs> The, the thing with windows is that they are the probably the single biggest ticket item in a whole job. You know, typically sort of eight to ten percent of the, the construction budget goes on on the yeah. glazing, and and once in, they're not easily changed. So you yeah. know, like I remember when Kath and Kim were were talking about Kath's wedding and and they were at Fountain Gate, and uh, they were they were wrangling over something they couldn't quite afford, and and Kath turned to Kim and said. It's all right, Kimmy. We can always skimp on the essentials. <laughs> <laughs> classic, classic. Yeah. Do not do this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because you know, once they're in, they're in, and and yeah. like Sarah's, you know, case study shows that the benefit is locked in for a long time. Mm. Mm. And on the That's flip side, oh, sorry, Simone, you go. So I just want to say, and what I find quite interesting, you know, coming from Germany, in Australia, everyone is always, you know, what's my return or my, my payback time, you know, for my yeah. windows or my insulation. But no one ever asked, what's my payback for my Caesar stone? 
or for my whatever yes. or hundred thousand dollar kitchen no one cares but everyone is so yes. concerned you know, how long does it take me to pay back whatever the windows or the insulation of, of course there is a bit of an incentive but for me it's the comfort because when we when we renovated our old um quick veneer uh, unit that had single glazed aluminum windows so we insulated the whole lot we put in double glazed upvc windows and the big thing for me was it wasn't cold I could sit on my dining room table with the window behind me and I didn't need a scarf anymore. I would, could just sit there and I was comfortable mm -hmm. and my babies could crawl on the floor and I wouldn't need to worry that they get sick or something. You know, that's a peace of mind that's kind of priceless. You know, obviously you don't want to put hundreds of yeah. thousand dollars or, you know, a fortune into it. But, you know, there is a, a price or a value for that too. And the um, condensation on the frames as well. In many climates, we've all lived, most of us have lived in houses. We have to get up every morning and dry off the, yeah. the windows or the frames. Um, so lots of compounding benefits. And I guess the flip side of what we're saying um, on the importance of getting it right when you're building new is that if you are in a renovation or retrofit um, scenario, um, buildings, uh, windows, probably or definitely aren't going to be at the top of your list just for that that bang for buck scenario so um, the flip side if some people are here are renovating you're usually looking at addressing um, in the very affordable to address draft ceiling window dressings and window shading and then you're probably looking at insulation you know starting at the ceiling and then the walls down you look at um, upgrading your appliances and then one of the last things that will probably make cost um, effective sense is the windows um, and there's another case study from our own house in Canberra on the website where we we laid out the steps we did and what the prices were and we got we got a 60 percent reduction in heating and cooling by spending less than ten thousand dollars so um, I hope people can understand why windows are so windows complex themselves. but powerful yeah and we didn't un upgrade yeah. the windows so yeah. they're important but also they have to be in context for your project and if you're designing from scratch if you're designing a new build then um, for, for window design I mean obviously it, it's it's a, always a very good idea to talk to an energy rater to who can model or, or you know a designer a good, yeah. a good designer like any one of you three who can model for you the effect of different window sizes and different look yeah. different orientations um, the, of different it, sides of your building and so forth um, the key on that I think is to find an assessor or a, consul, a, a um, professional who is consultive in that part you know, I see a lot of people um, reach out to um, an Athers assessor who is used to just providing compliance certificates um, yeah. at the end of the day. So you really need to find the right consultant, obviously coming from a Lighthouse background, I'm still working with Lighthouse as um, the energy efficiency consultant. It's a very different experience because they help you optimise your windows and your shading. And for the retrofits, they'll provide a table of those cost benefit steps and um, what your, your projected results are. Um, are predicted to be so the key is to find um not just the right um, professional but also someone that's used to collaboratively working in that design phase um, getting Anna, back to the yes go on i just wondered if, can we start a crowdfunding for fiona jay who just posted we went for double glazed pvc windows we have no kitchen <laughs> i was about to mention that <laughs> oh, that's good excellent prioritization there fiona jay <laughs> the middle. but i hope you can afford a kitchen soon um so but, another but question on another question on windows um somebody uh gavin asked does the panel believe that steel framed windows are a no-no full stop you can get thermally broken steel frame windows and they actually can be bell rated as well oh really wow they're, so they're quite rated expensive bushfire, bushfire, oh, um, rated for bushfire prone builds mm. yeah. not cheap uh -huh. yeah. okay. you'll have no kitchen yeah. <laughs> but, but one thing I wanted to mention as well with windows, what Sarah had said before, that you have to be a bit more mindful with your window design and where you place windows. Because often we have, uh, you know, clients that say, you know, they want full height windows everywhere in the room, you know, on either side. And, you know, A, it costs a lot of money to have that much glazing. B, it's unpractical if you have full height windows everywhere. Where do you put your furniture? And it doesn't look good if you have your tables or your, your desk or your, your sofas against glazing. You know, it's nonsense. Uh, but also you lose a lot of heat in winter. Like, like Sarah said, you know, windows are still the weak point in the house, no matter if you go for triple or quadruple glazing, it's still not as good as a wall. Yeah. So try to be a bit more mindful. Where are your fuse? Where are you actually going out? Or if you have fuse on, on the south side or on the western side, 
rather than having full height windows everywhere, can you do picture frame windows, you know, to actually frame your windows. So try to be a bit more, you know, um, proactive with the window design and a bit more careful where you place them strategically. Yeah, and the, the general rule of thumb, not, not taking into account views, but in temperate regions is to have most of your window, most of your windows on the north, most of your glazing on the north with appropriate shading, um, min, none to very minimal on the west and east, and small windows on the south for cross ventilation. Is that, am I on the right track? Yeah. Well, that's the rule, starting rule of yeah. thumb, and then you have to adapt it to each side. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a question about low E, and I could very oh, yeah. briefly mention that. People get yeah, very confused yeah. about all the films and things. Low E is a um, really great thing in a cool, temperate climate. And without, uh, it's, it's hard to quickly explain, but it essentially increases the insulative performance of your window without limiting that solar gain so much. It was included in the little numbers case study um, that I had today. And I think off the top of my head, the cost of adding it to that project was $900 for the whole house. And the predicted benefit over the 20 years was, uh, it was maybe two grand. Or, or something so it can it can it's worthwhile doing in those cooler climates it, it's and also it's a, it's, a sort of, it's a film that you apply to one layer of your of your double glazing right yeah yeah and and it's selective in in terms of its directionality and we mm. had a very unfortunate experience some years ago with with uh, one of our owner builder clients who who had a heart of gold and threw everything into her project and just did the most beautiful job but she got led astray by a window supplier you know, she plonked her plans down on the counter and said, I've got this wonderful, you know, energy efficient design. And, and he just went, oh, well, then you'll want smart glass. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, yeah, smart glass used the wrong way, became very dumb. And she now has to open her north facing sliding doors to get any solar gain onto her thermal mass. Oh, dear. Which mm. is quite, you know, not really what you want to do on a cold winter's day, but um Great yeah. marketing, though. Smart glass it sounds great. <laughs> the 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 um, celebrated Fiona J would like to know whether you can apply um, low E later after windows have been installed. I don't think so. I don't actually know. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, there are certain you, films. You can words. do films, but yeah. yeah, there are WERS ratings. Sorry, the Window Energy Rating Scheme WERS. Um, it it it's it's pretty good. I mean, it's not perfect. It could be worse. Um. No one got that joke. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> it, it was... I did. I was a bit slow. I got to... it. <laughs> laugh. No, I wouldn't have either. Anyway, there is a WERS rating for films. So if you get mm. onto WERS.org.au, W-E-R-S, there is a, a rating scheme for films that can be applied after the event. Which is a bit different from a low, low E coating, which is what we were talking about before, um, which is applied during the manufacture of the windows. Yeah. But it can be a, a good retrofitting well. options. Yeah, there are a few yeah. things on the market, but you have to be careful as well what climate you are in. You, you know, if you want the, the sun in, you know, like, uh, or the, if you want the sun to warm your house, like in a colder climate, or if you need a film that really completely stops the sun coming in, if you're somewhere more in the tropics or so. So you have to be careful what film you put on. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what else is there to say about windows? I think um, we we should probably just. I mean, it's, it, this is a. As we've said before, this is a webinar topic of its own. It's um, the probably the last thing to talk about is just that there are different um, uh, windows have different levels of performance, and uh, yeah, so perhaps we can talk about how that's a little just touch on how that's um, rated and what to what to know about yep. U value and with with passive house, coefficient. the distinction with passive house windows is that they have to be. Uh, demonstrably and certified, well, pretty pre preferably certifiedly airtight, with with very low um, conductivity through the frame, mm -hmm. measured in different ways to the way, for instance, Natters um, analyzes windows. So that's that's one of the key differences really between classic passive solar and passive house is that when we're specifying windows for either, uh, you know, it's just a different way of looking at them, different an analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but maybe if we go to U value and R value, now, like you said before, and our R value is for insulation and the higher the R value, the better. The yeah. U value is actually the opposite, the lower, the better. And uh, if you look it's at- also the, an, It's also a measure of insulative performance, right? But specifically for yeah. windows. And for some yeah, reason, yeah. it's just the inverse of the R value. 
Yeah, arithmetically, they're the inverse of each other. Yeah. If I want to find the person who decided that was a good idea. And I yeah. want to go for a very long walk with them. Yeah. <laughs> it does seem silly, people. doesn't it? Everybody yeah. understands our values. Yeah. Nobody understands your values. And yet they are yeah. just simply the flip of each other. What? Yeah. yeah. A, a little fun thing what I often do if I go to expos, I go to window manufacturer and ask them what the U value is. And if they don't, if they don't even know what their U value is, then you should probably turn them on that go as well. Because typically they say, yeah, our windows are really energy efficient. Yeah, how? Yeah, yeah, they yes. are. Yes. So what's your value? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And then that's not a good sign. Yeah. Um, One trick to be careful of though is that our values are different in America. So we have people mm -hmm. sort of often looking up um things and with the wonders of the internet you have to really watch that and you need to change your pages to Australia when you're looking up that information and and another um, final tip on windows Anna for the especially for the um, retrofitters um, mm. when we talk about adding good quality window dressings internally when those when good quality window dressings are closed they will give you the effectiveness of um, another layer of glass and um, what we mean when we say good quality window dressings is, uh, you know, both um, the material itself is, is thick enough to be effective, but it also has to reduce air movement past the glass. So whether that's a curtain with a pelmet over the top or um, blinds that fit in nicely within the re reveal, you know, your goal is to stop that convection current past the glass. And that's great when you actually do want your curtains or your blinds closed and not so great when you want to see out your windows. But, yeah, they're absolutely, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a cost-effective way to increase the performance of your windows for sure. Mm -hmm. And likewise, um, external shading, uh, external window treatments are really important for keeping the sun off your glass mm -hmm. in summer. Um, yes, glad you mentioned that because a lot yeah. of people think that the curtains are doing that job in, in summer, um, but they do a really minimal <laughs> job at keeping heat out because essentially the heat's already come in your glass. It's just you're just delaying it radiating into the room. So yeah. external shading for summer and internal window dressings to keep the warmth in. And there's a huge range of different external shading options that you consider to you can consider, including trees and vegetation. Uh, particularly deciduous um, vines and trees and so forth are great because they drop their leaves in winter, let the sun stream in and go nice and green and bushy in summer and block the sun. <laughs> but, but maybe another um, tip as well when it comes to placing what kind of doors or windows you, you, you do, uh, mm. just in terms of priority, in terms of costing. So, so typically bifolds are the most expensive ones and the most leaky. So ideally, you know, I would probably recommend avoid bifolds if you can or if you must have, you know, minimize them. The next one would then be stacker slider when you have the sliders that go behind each other. Also really expensive and they can sometimes leak a bit more. The next uh, option down would be then the normal sliders. And then what we often do with projects is, you know, say you have a four meter wide opening and rather than having three or four panes, you just have two. So you have whatever mm -hmm. two meter fix and two meter opener, and you have this nice big window frame, which costs much less than the stacking sliders. And or, or, or the bifolds, but also with the bifolds, you have all the mullions. So, you know, so once they're, once they're closed, you have all those interruptions. So I'm a big fan of the big sliders. But if money is a bit of an issue, then definitely go for French doors because French doors cost a fraction. And we were just looking at it in the office today, often 40 or 60% less than a sliding door. So, you know, if, if you work on your design, just be smart and think about, okay, which, which is the area I'm going out all the time? And, you know, there might be one or two big sliding doors you want. But if you can, you know, go to French doors or go to single hinge doors or something, it, it really saves the fortune, makes a big impact. Yeah, so and, the takeaway the the take there. Yeah, same yeah exactly. The takeaway there is to um, take into account the, when you're choosing the style of doors and windows, is to take into account the cost and the, um, the ease of sealing, yeah. the ease of yeah. draft sealing them, yeah. Because you could easily save tw whatever, 20 or $30,000 on a project by coming up with a smart window or door layout. And then you have a bit more money to spend on higher quality glazing. So there's a bit of a... Yeah, especially if you stick ones. with... Is, is it true to say that if you stick with standard sizes, then it's it's cheaper? Is there such a thing as standard sizes anymore? Maybe it used to be a bit more. Yeah, that I asked yeah. um, uh, I asked one of the UPVC manufacturers this a few years ago, and he said they were sort of at the at the point where they were making them all to order anyway. So maybe yeah. it's true for some companies in in that really tight budget bracket. Yeah, not, none that I'm aware of. It would only really be very low budget end that that might apply. Mm. I think it's disappeared. 
what what comes into play is a little bit the height of windows and doors and where you're mm. getting the glazing from because if the windows get taller than 2.4 meters some suppliers don't have them or if if you look at importing windows from overseas or something that sometimes get a bit of gets a bit of an issue or i think if the the, the glazing gets taller than 2.4 meters they have to put an extra toughening or something so the, the the cost adds a little bit after that but otherwise yeah there's no real restriction on size Okay, is that all we want to talk about, say about windows? Someone's made the point um, in the chat that uh, windows are so poor at insulation that their R values are tiny. That's why the, that's why the inverse is used and <laughs> it's referred to as a U value, which has probably got some, some, some uh, validity to it. <laughs> the numbers are better to work with, probably true. Um, still hard to, hard to um, get your head around when, you, mm. when you're starting out with these things. Yep. Just I'm just scrolling back to see if we have any more um, good window questions. To, uh, someone asked, does the e, does low E um, film or treatment throw a reflective green tinge to windows? Not that I've ever noticed. Yeah. No. You can get tinted windows as well. It's a bit mm. of a different thing, right? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think that pretty much covers the fundamental features. That that. Covers the list that I had. Um, Did we do thermal the mass? Sorry. Thermal oh no, we haven't done thermal mass. Good point. Mm. Um, let's talk a little bit about thermal mass. What is it? Mm. And why is it important? Dick, go for it. Building oh. materials guru. Um, well, thermal mass is, is simply a, a kind of a building battery for warmth and cool. So uh, you can invest um, solar heat into concrete, brick. They're the two most typical materials of thermal mass, and it will absorb it and, and hold it and then re-radiate it later. Uh, and likewise, uh, if you shade and insulate your building in summer, then your body heat will be in, invested into that cooler thermal mass, and you will perceive cool from it rather than warmth. And, uh, and then that has to be um, unloaded overnight, typically um, when the building is, is open to breathe and, and let go of its heat. No. And again, uh, like we had mentioned earlier before, you know, here the energy weighting or, you know, passive force calculations or whatever you do should be your friend because you can actually have too much thermal mass in a house as yes. well. But within the energy program, you can actually calculate, is it is it beneficial or is it actually making your house too cold or too hot? And the key yeah. thing is insulating it from the outside Same world, thing. right? Yeah, exactly. so a lot of people m make um, the mistake of interchanging thermal mass with insulation which is a really big misconception. I think there was a, a question that was submitted earlier, Anna, about a double brick wall. Um, uh, you know, a double brick wall is a huge amount of thermal maths, but it's, it's insulative level is like R0.5 or something, um, uh, which, which means it's not thermal mass that's working hard for you. You really need to have that thermal mass insulated. And exactly what Simone said about um, optimizing it, you know, with the, uh, we find that a, a concrete slab house doesn't really need any added. Sometimes clients ask us about doing reverse brick veneer, but the slab in itself um, is really, really doing the best job. And then the important point on that is that when you've got that insulated um, thermal mass, you really need to make sure that it's not getting sunstruck. So you, that's where you want to make sure that it's designed and, sh and shaded correctly, because if you have um, a lovely insulated house and insulated thermal mass, and then the sun's smashing it in the afternoon, you're not up for a good time. But you, you, don't, you mean it's not getting sunstrike in summer when you don't want to? Yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, sl yeah, slip there. Yeah, in, in yeah. summer, definitely. Yeah, so the you idea want it to get sunstrike in winter. Yeah, so the idea of including thermal mass in your sustainable build is to put it in places where it will um, be hit by the sun, direct sun through windows mm. in winter, winter, warm up, and then it kind of acts like, a, my understanding of it is that it kind of acts like a regulator for the internal temperature because mm. it, it warms up in the sun and then that, um, that warmth is radiated through the house when it's mm. cooler at night. And um, likewise in summer, yeah, like Dick was saying, it uh, it can kind of absorb heat from the air, the internal mm. air during the day, and then if you per if you open all the windows in the cool of the night, then then it resets that that, that thermal yeah. mass. Yeah, the yeah. easiest way it was explained to me that it all really clicked for me back in my student days was to understand yeah. that warmth always moves to the cooler surface. 
So if you're in a, a, a house overnight and you're ventilating it in summer, that the warm slab is always is going to release the energy and you ventilate it out. And then during the day when you close down, the warmth in your body or in the room as it warms up will move towards the cold slab. And then you get the reverse of that happening in, in winter. The sun's coming in during the day, um, mm. warming up the room, and then that's also getting soaked into the slab. And then at nighttime, as the room starts to cool down, that warmth will release into the room. So I was, it always sounds a bit um, crazy that this thing can work in both summer and winter, but it absolutely yeah. does, and it's very powerful. Yeah, it's New Newtonian physics at the end of the day, isn't it? <laughs> um, the other um, thing about also... slabs yeah. and, and insulation is that we've found with Passive House, you have to insulate the slab edge. Mm. Uh, and we found it's advantageous uh, in Passive Solar to do so as well. So it's another yeah. thing, that a bit of cross-fertilisation between the two disciplines mm. there. You mentioned reverse brick veneer before, Sarah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? We yeah, well, can we 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 um rarely do it for um thermal benefit because we've sort of got the thermal mass optimized um in the floor, but essentially it's switching your wall inside out. Um, a lot of people are are shocked to learn that that bricks on a traditional house are just cladding; they're just there yeah. as your rain screen at the end. They're not structural. Um, in a newer house where you've insulated. Um, they're outside of the insulation, so they're not doing much for you other than being a really robust sort of skin. Um, so you can flip it around and it is quite thermally effective to get, then get that thermal mass on the inside. Um, and sometimes that's a nice thing to couple with aesthetics, um, but it does increase your, your cost from standard construction because you have to sort of change how the footings are and think mm -hmm. about um, your power points and, and things like that. Um, and I should note, we didn't talk about um, when you should insulate under your slab. I don't know if you want to take that one, Dick. <laughs> we have had a couple of people submit that variations on that question. Uh, we, we always say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so thermal. What, mass, what does it depend on? Yeah, so it depends on, on what your, where your climate zone is, your topography. Um, it depends on what your deep subsoil temperatures are going to be. Uh, we, you know, which are quite different in different parts of the country. So you, you really have to revert to the thermal modeling to find out. Hmm. You, you don't want to leave those things to chance. You really should test yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah. And same, even with the slab edge insulation, um, the difference is quite big. Um, you know, we find on a house that's on a really flat site where um, there's very little slab edge exposed. Perhaps if the budget's tight, we, we might sort of model that difference and, um, clients can make a decision on that. Whereas the effect, if it's on a sloping site and you've got a bit more slab exposed is much um, greater. So it's, it's all dependent on site and context and the local climate. David has asked um, if a house is tightly sealed and insulated and hence necessarily air conditioned, or I think he probably means ventilated, you know, mechanically yeah. ventilated, like a passive house, is thermal mass needed or desirable so, yeah, uh, that's a good um, point. It's it's not really needed anymore. So we've done quite a lot of passive houses where we don't have thermal mass. And I think Dick had mentioned it before. You know, if you're working on a site where you can't have a slab, for instance, because you're on a on a big slope and where you have really bad solar access, then passive house can work really well. Um, it it still can help. Yeah. You know, it can still be modeled in and it can assist. But I think it's not not as important as in a typical passive solar house, which relies quite heavily on the thermal mass to assist uh, the house performing. Yeah, it's still, possible, I mean, it's still possible to do it to, to build a high performing house without thermal mass. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not yeah. I wouldn't associate that with with um, um, solar passive. Um, I guess we would always just be be using mm -hmm. the um, the Nathers assessment to to mm -hmm. work out the difference. We do that for people even with floor coverings. You know, some people might yeah. say I'm tossing up between exposing the concrete here or adding mm -hmm. carpet over, and you can you can model that and work out what the effect will be there. So mm -hmm. yeah, light and tight definitely works. Yeah. And I'm sort of going down that rabbit hole at the moment as I get more and more into um, carbon life cycle analysis, which we, we don't know, that's another rabbit hole, maybe next week, next week's that session. But, you know, so. then you start to get into, you've got your NatHERS modelling on one side and your, your carbon um, analysis and they do interplay with each other and um, you start offsetting the better performance of the slab and the high embodied and it all, it all plays around and it's an interesting space to play in as well. 
Definitely. Anybody got anything else to say about thermal mass before we move on? Thermal bridging <laughs> as well. Um, yeah. We, we should touch on, um, like Dick, Dick was talking about thermal bridging the walls before, mm. exactly the same in the slab. You really don't want your house slab um, connecting out to your um, porch or your pathway around your house because that's a just one big conductor um, Very good coming point, yeah. in and out of the house. Yeah. So you want to put in a uh, some kind of thermal break and pour that outside slab separately. Well, yeah, even to the garage as well. Is, is where the, the veranda or patio slab might be cantilevered. Mm -hmm. and and there are some neat systems typically um, coming out of Germany that allow cantilevers to happen whilst providing a thermal break. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're not cheap, but quite often you can do it quite simply by simply not cantilevering, just adding some columns to take the, the, the weight externally. So we've covered... In our list of fundamental features of low energy buildings, we've covered passive heating and cooling, orientation, solar access, uh, window design, shading, thermal mass, insulation, air tightness and control, the importance of controlled ventilation as opposed to draftiness. Um, or maybe just talking, uh, we could talk a little bit about renovation or retrofit, you know, what people can do to get the house less drafty. Yeah, that's the next, that's the next section, Simone. I'll yeah. pause. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <I> just <laughs> I just want to I just want to quickly before we move on from the fundamentals mention the importance of considering house size. Um, Sarah touched on it really briefly right at the start, mm. but um, do you want yeah, to? Yeah, we often forget to talk that? about this, um, and it's a really important one to understand in line with the Nathurs ratings because the Nathurs ratings are per square meter, and a lot of people don't realise that. So if you have a um, eight star house. And um, they're also not linear. So an eight-star house um, in Canberra's climate is predicted to use 50% less energy than a six-star house. So if you put that eight-star house next to a six-star house that's double the size, you know, your energy use is, is predicted to be sort of on par for heating and cooling. Um, but that plays into everything, you know. Um, you mean it, the other way around, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, did I say that double. the wrong way around? Yeah, double, yes, uh, a double, a double, a twice as big eight star house. Will you? <laughs> yeah, everyone knows a, what I mean. Six, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> twice the house, twice so the, the energy star energy rating's <laughs> higher, but the energy use will be the same because it's a bigger house. Mm. Yes, thank yeah. you, Anna. It's been a long day. <laughs> Um, but that, and, you know, that goes for our materials and our resources as well um, and all the kind of compounding things, you know, some big houses, people start to want two hot water systems and, you know, all those things. So, yeah. you know, it's not about forcing people into um, tiny homes. It's about just really ass assessing what you need in your house, um, looking at your values and your situation rather than just looking at the status quo and saying, okay, I'm building a new house. So it has to have all of these things. Um, mm -hmm. Australians build the biggest houses in the world on par with America. And that's just a, a staggering statistic. I don't think we, we have, um, I don't think it necessarily gives us a better, you know, quality of life or anything. If anything, mm. it probably makes us more antisocial and debt ridden and <laughs> means that we're stretching our budgets. Um, and a lot of people who are considering energy efficiency might think they can't afford certain things. But if you consider that every square meter of your house is um, a couple of grand, um, getting the design right, considering your values and building what, um, uh, I think Jenny last week referenced people oriented design, what they call the least house necessary um, is, is really your number one saving across all fronts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think th was... thinking about uh, multi multifunctional spaces rather than having the typical five bedroom houses, because everyone says you need a five bedroom house for visa purpose. But if you are, you know, just a couple or you have, you know, one child, why would you need five bedrooms? You know, just because the real estate agent says so. You know, I, yeah. I think people have to rethink that a little bit as well and more about, you know, what do you actually need? Because most families don't need a five bedroom house. We had a really good discussion about this last week in the, the session that people can go back and watch online with um, in a, a re a really, really unpacking the, the importance of considering your values and the lifestyle that you want to live in the house mm -hmm. um, rather than starting with a list of how many rooms you want and so forth, you know. And uh, yeah, like building less house means that you are using fewer materials, less money, less energy to heat and cool it, less energy to your own personal energy to clean it. You know, it's just good all around, really. In New South Wales, basics, which is the, the regulatory hoop you have to jump through 
as distinct from the National Construction Code in other states. And, and BASICS allows natters or Passive House, or it's got its own silly little DIY tool in there that wouldn't be there, but that's another story. Um, but <laughs> it, it is now introducing for the first time a measure of the embodied carbon in, in and I know we're not talking about materials in this segment, but but it's interesting that the one regulatory tool that, that traditionally had always just measured operational energy and thermal comfort is now also considering as part of that equation that the size, the quantity, and, and the kind of materials that are being used. We are, I was just going to briefly touch on material choice and embodied energy um, being, you know, as we have a, really only been talking about low energy from the point of view of operational energy, energy you need to heat and cool and run your house tonight so far. But there is another thing, which is embodied energy, which is the, the energy in, embodied literally in the materials you use to build your house. Um, from the production of the raw materials to the manufacture of the product, to the transport and so forth. Um, we're not gonna talk about that much more tonight, except to say that it exists and it's a thing and it's an important part of sustainable thinking, sustainable design. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing a session on building materials and that's gonna be talking about embodied energy too. So if anyone who's interested in that, in digging into that in more detail, come back next Tuesday. <laughs> So I want to, I really want to jump over to focus on retrofits and renovations now, guys, because, you know, I think it probably seems easy enough to people listening in tonight to um, incorporate low energy design strategies in a new build, mm -hmm. especially if you find yourself a great designer. Um, but where do they start if they're renovating an existing house? Mm -hmm. How do they, how, how, do, how should we be identifying the best retrofit opportunities, best bang for buck, if you like? What are some DIY options? Um, what can we, what can we offer people to take away? And, get stuck into tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess what I mentioned earlier in the session is the lowest hanging fruit are going to be the draft ceiling, um, the window dressings, uh, and those things alone can get you a difference. And those things alone can cost, you know, less than um, $5,000, um, even far less. I, I just popped in the chat. Um, greenityourself.com.au is a favourite resource of mine by Lish Fayer. And she does little videos on all the ways you can do useful draft ceiling in your house. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, if you want definitive answers, you can get that collaborative energy assessor that I spoke about to really um, lay out the different steps for you um, and what the effect of them is going to be. But I, as, as we've already touched on, the order is usually um, then to go to insulation from the top down um, and the, the last, uh, and then appliances. Um, we sometimes forget to talk about appliances um, as designers because they're usually user choices and at the end, but, you know, putting in a, a energy efficient hot water system can be one of the best things you can do. And then finally, you would look at swapping over those windows. Yeah. And, and things like draft proofing your exhaust fans in your bathroom or the kitchen, uh, or if you have old fireplaces that are unused or, you know, probably in general, get rid of fireplaces overall. And, you know, if, if you look into it a little bit more with your health, um, that might be a completely different topic again. Um, but, you know, just try to keep uh, all the, the areas where heat, or, you know, can come in or go out. Close them off. And just... uh, getting rid of gas. Yes. Yeah. Good one. Yeah. There was a, a question earlier, someone was sort of re re retrofitting or renovating and they were a bit worried about then um, how whether they would start to have issues with air quality and um, condensation management. So, I mean, the, the condensation management in a retrofit scenario, it's not, it's not hard. You just, you need to make sure that you've got good exhaust fans out of your bathroom and in your kitchen and that those fans have a some kind of either a back damper built into them. So they close when they're not being used or you can get these things. I don't know if I can mention brands, but a draft stopper that you sit yes. over the top of your old fans um, that sort of close the back draft. And, and um, the fans don't go into the roof space. They need to go. Well, next. yeah, that's that's a big, big problem with those, um, yes. isn't it? Um, try and get that moisture out of your roof space, definitely. Um, mm. But as long as you're thinking means about ducting it, ducting it through the eaves instead or through the wall. Yeah. Well, yeah, or yeah, up through, the through, the, through the roof, or through the roof, through the eaves, yeah. or, or yeah. through the wall, where, wherever, but just not not into the roof space. Not into your roof space. Yeah. Mm. And, and then on the option. Sorry, you go. sorry, and I was just going to say, and on the air tightness, if you're DIY retrofitting yourself, 
it would be very hard for you to to even get to that um, level where you're going to start having problems with with air um, air quality. It's tricky when we talk about this because the scope is so big. So you know we've we've um, lighthouse not we anymore at lighthouse we had air <laughs> leakage tested um, homes that got a rating of um, twenty or even thirty. Um, that's at the um, the the test air pressure of this fifty pascals air changes per hour at the test pressure of fifty pascals. That's a confusing term, but if you just remember that it's that twenty to thirty. Um, whereas we're talking about that really high level air leakage of the passive house standard, um, that's below 0.1. Is that right? 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.6. 0.6. Yeah. And then you can, you know, there's all that room in between. So um, in the in a lot of the new builds I've worked on, we've aimed for standard construction, aiming for that sort of four to eight. If you were retrofitting your own house um, in a renovation scenario, like I'd be really impressed if you if you got below what eight um and you would still see really great results but i i, de I don't think you'd have to be worried about your air quality i don't know if simone or dick uh, feel differently we've, about that we've, we've done some sampling um uh andy marlow my my partner at envirotecture actually put some co2 um sensors into a number of buildings in, including his own and and his young daughter's bedroom um, reach dangerous levels of CO2. So he's in a 102-year-old um, house in Newtown in Sydney and uh, in his daughter's bedroom. And, and this house is unrenovated, you know, well, it was before he, when mm. he bought it, before he got stuck in. And, and his daughter's bedroom reached dangerously high levels of CO2 at about half past two every morning in winter. Really? Um, yeah, which, which surprised us. That, that wasn't part of the script. The script was, oh, leaky old houses, they're okay. But mm. not so yeah. sure and and so we're concerned that when people renovate or build and they end up with uh numbers around the the sort of two to eight um air changes per hour that mm. they're actually in a danger zone that you know sort of mm. eight to ten and beyond it's so leaky it doesn't matter unless yeah. two, you know you're in hrv mm. territory anyway so there's mm. that kind of in-between zone that that people don't know they need an hrv but probably really do so get a sensor it goes back yeah. to that thing of getting a sensor yeah. if you're worried. That probably said before, you know, if, if you get a sensor and what you can actually do, you can kind of retrofit a mechanical ventilation system. But yeah, you with, a new, yeah. with a new build, you have the centralized system where you have the, the big unit and you get light uh, air into every room, but you can actually put in this decentralized one. So that means you just go to a room and it's like two units that are kind of on opposite sides of a wall and they kind of interchange. So one pushes in fresh air and the other sucks it out. And then they alternate and this one pushes in the air and that sucks it out. Mm. And that's a good way. So they can, they can be retrofitted. They can mm. easily be retrofitted and they work quite, you know, even for apartments or something. But but if you have a space that has mold issue or, you know, if you actually put in the sensor and you realize there is a bit of an issue, that's a really good uh, thing to yeah. retrofit and get rid of the excess humidity and the CO2. I just put the, a link in the chat um, for a, to a sanctuary article uh, just getting back to the somebody made the point before that you could you can get a sustainable designer or an energy rater or somebody to um, to assess your house and um, pro provide a, a list of of possible retrofits or renovations that you can you could carry out even with costings um, yep. to help you assess what's going to get you the best um, yep. the best outcome. Mm. what to focus on and uh there's an article where that looks at a project that um where where the homeowner did exactly that and what the results were and and which ones she chose to go with and how it all panned out and so i just yeah. think it's a really interesting article mm. to get get yeah. for people to get an understanding of what that process mm. might look like for their existing houses and, and i think it's quite important as well to to start with a bit of a master plan, you know, talk with a specialist or someone who can help you a little bit and think about, you know, what are all the things that could be done at my house and then look at, you know, what is the low hanging fruit? What are the things that I can do myself or the things that yeah. don't cost much? And then maybe over the years, you know, you can keep adding to those. And, and one thing what I just wanted to mention, not sure if, if many people have heard of it yet, there's actually a new kind of community thing going up at Evitat, which is looking at, you know, helping people to retrofit and, and improve the energy efficiency of homes. Um, where you can look at products and create a bit of a logbook to see, you know, how your house is tracking or, you know, how you could improve things. Um, so that might be something, you know, I just put a chat in, which is, you know, a, a good free tool where people can check out some resources as well for when it comes to renovation and extensions. Someone's just asked what the retrofit lungs are called, Simone. <laughs> 
<laughs> They're called decentralized mechanical ventilation yes, systems yes. with heat yes, recovery. Yes. They have heat, they yep. incorporate heat recovery, which is what I was talking yes, about before. Yes, so you yes. don't lose the um, ambient warmth in your house by when yep. the pressure comes in. Um, that's why they alternate uh, to to enable that to happen. Yep. Um, so we, we sort of talked about DIY retrofits and there's some great tips there. What about renovations? What about, um, you know, if you've got a house that's too big or the wrong orientation or whatever, um, how, what, what options are there for people out there to take their existing houses and renovate them? This is totally up your alley, Sarah, and my house. <laughs> yeah. My house um, earlier, I know. Uh, what, what are the, what's possible? Well, I mean, I think there's a category of house type here that we're missing a word for, because often when we talk about renovate, we we think of a, a very tight budget, often just superficial sort of changes, not really changing the house that much. And um, it's sort of seen as this patching up of the house. Um, and then when we think of a new build at the other end of the spectrum, we've got everything replaced. But often we then pay more to put in these beautiful recycled elements or sort of um, salvaged, beautiful crafted items. Um, and there's a bit of a disparity there. And I think there's this middle type of house that we need some kind of different word for. Um, and I say to clients that it's a new house, but with a, a lot of in situ recycled elements. And that's where you're doing a really significant renovation. And look, it might be 75% of the budget of a new build, but you're essentially getting um, a new house and you're upgrading all of those things that need to be upgraded. You might be doing some pop-outs. Um, you'd be doing, you know, new kitchen bathrooms, um, but you're still reusing a lot of the good bits. Um, you might reuse a lot of your framing. Um, you know, you've got some beautiful floorboards there. You keep some of the services, maybe your roof's intact. Maybe you renovated one of the bathrooms a while ago. Um, and, and, you know, there's a real, we've got to stop, um, placing no value on things that have been made and, and really value things that have already had a lot of effort and love mm. put into them being placed there. And um, embodied and, energy. <laughs> yes. And stop just being obsessed with the attractiveness of something new and shiny and the pursuit of something perfect. Yeah. And often, the, you know, often the bedrooms are all perfectly fine and, for example... Yeah, um, look, it does depend on the house. So, some houses yeah. have great bones and it really yeah. will take not much to make a huge difference. I've also been to houses where the advice has been, you know, look, we there's probably not much worth saving here and um, mm. we probably do knock it over and start again. But usually yeah. you can do something pretty great. Yeah, I often say, you know, if the house, like you said, so if the house has good bones and the things are yeah. kind of in the right location and you have to move a few walls, open up things or, you know, add a room or change windows, it's fine. But if you have to turn everything on its head, you know, if you have to put the bedrooms where the kitchen was or vice versa, if you change everything, then often the cost can get quite as significant as doing a new build. Or, or if you had lots of mold in the house, you know, that's often the thing where I say, okay, you know, this is, we're getting into tricky territory. Even if we fix it, the mold might stay inside the walls. You know, that's where you have to be a bit careful. Yeah. But, you know, there's so many beautiful old homes out there that have really great features. And it's just a shame if they're just bulldozed over for something. Yeah. I'm just, the, the projects that inspire me most when I'm looking for projects for Sanctuary, to be perfectly honest, are not the fancy new builds. They're the projects where a house has been modified in really often quite minimal ways. Um, like Sarah was saying, a little a little pop out to a room that just adds two square meters that allows it to have a north facing window, or mm -hmm. you know, um, removing a wall between the and putting in a new kitchen, removing the wall between the kitchen and the living room, and mm -hmm. even you know, moving swapping a bedroom and a living room so that the living room's got the north facing window. Whatever it is, it's just mm -hmm. those those really small um, interventions uh, that make a massive difference to the quality of life, the comfortableness of the, of the, the home to live in, the energy, the energy needed to heat and cool it. It's, it's just, they're just really inspiring. Mm. And so I often don't say, think, don't, don't write your house off. <laughs> yeah. And constraints create delight. You know, it's yeah. really easy if you've got this blank slate to deal with, but it's probably going to be a bit more boring, to be honest. Yep. Yeah. And how do you know if prioritising low energy design in your build or reno is going to actually be worth it from a performance point of view and a comfortable living point of view? I mean, let's talk Speak about professional. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about in energy rating and, um, and doing that in an iterative way, using that as a design tool. Do, do you mean when, when should you use it, Anna? Is that what you're asking? Um, 
well, yes, when and just, you know, letting people know that that's an option. It's, yeah, I think as, as early as possible, you know. Yeah, a lot of people someone mentioned getting tools... an energy rating just as a compliance thing before. Yeah, um, yeah. But let's think, can you talk about using it as a, as a design tool? Yeah, and I think the important thing is, um, uh, you know, again, this, the science and the rating tools aren't, um, aren't in opposition to then designers who know the theory you know, ideally you have both going hand in hand. Mm. So the tools are that they're just a tool. You have to know how to, to drive them and, and apply them intelligently. Um, but, you know, my process is to, to do the, the concept design, my best go at what I think it is. And then right at that first sketch, um, I get the Nathurs assessor to come in um, and advise on tweaking it. Uh, you know, and luckily I know enough, there's, there's not that many tweaks, but someone less experienced, if people are going it on their own, there might be some really big advice. But even those minor tweaks, even if you have an experienced designer, um, it's worth getting that science on board because every site is different and every house is different and there might still be things that that pop up and, and little benefits really add up over the lifetime of the house. Hmm. And you can really fine tune, you know, which windows need external shading, you know, which windows are fine because, you know, the, the trees or your neighbor might overshadow you enough, or sometimes you might need to, you know, tweak it a bit and maybe move the window a bit because another wall is blocking it. So you can really fine tune and hone in, or, you know, potentially make windows a bit smaller or add another whatever highlight window to the north because you don't have enough solar access. So you can really hone in on, on, the, on the details. Um, yeah. Excellent, thanks. Dick, did you have anything to add to that? Oh, no, that, that's pretty much it. I mean, we, we've had instances where somebody's come to us saying, you know, we want to renovate our early 60s brick veneer and we go through the numbers and go, you know what, it's not worth it. Um, it's just too bad. And and other instances where, where somebody said, I want a new house. And we've looked at their existing one and said, well, do you know what? Um, if we whatever we this and this and this. <laughs> You know, it would look very much like what you've got now. All we need to do is X, Y, and Z. And, you know, so, yeah, it, it's very much driven by circumstances. Sorry about the light. I've got a moth that's flying around the light. <laughs> Fair enough. So um, I'm just going to flick to some, uh, skip, move over to some some more audience questions now. Um, Doug wants to know when will more passive design Passive solar design be enforced or legislated, and how can we support this essential change? Which is a very good leading question to um, for me to just make to, to note that finally, 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 the National Construction Code has um, is about to be changed to uh, make the mandatory minimum seven stars from the six stars that it has been at for more than ten years, which is um, it's really great. Uh, so perhaps who wants to? Dick, maybe you want to take a have, have a bit of a comment on that. Yeah. Situation? Look the, the seven stars is a step forward. There's no doubt. Um, yeah. it, it's a minimum, you know, it, it's what yeah. you, you don't go to jail for, for building seven stars or more. Now <laughs> um, there, there's been a lot of debate within the industry about whether that was enough and whether we should be going for net zero right now. And a lot of debate around what net zero is anyway, but what do you mean um, by net zero just for the viewers at home? Well, briefly, <laughs> we mean the million um, it, dollar it, question. It it means the ultimate, low, I guess, low energy building that that uses no external energy, but that can be measured or, and, or gen um, generates more than it uses. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that can be measured and defined in a number of different ways, so it gets yeah. a bit confusing. But suffice to say that um, seven stars is a step forward. Yeah. Uh, it will mean that. For instance, the project home industry is unlikely to be able to do what they've done for a while, which is take mediocrity to an extraordinarily sophisticated level where they had generic floor plans that could be sold onto any block of land facing any direction and they were equally bad in all directions, but but somehow they were good enough to get across the bar of, of five or six stars. So we're hoping that that will fall away and that will start actually addressing things like orientation now. Um, but yeah, we, we, it, it's not the end goal. Seven stars is a step along the road. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So that, and I think that the code, you know, doesn't force, you know, or mandates good solar access, but with the new regulations in order to get up to seven stars, people have to step up and have to use passive solar principles or they just won't be getting total seven stars. So it's a bit of a, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, so for, step for in the right direction, but not, not perfect. Yeah. yeah. And the, again, for that context, um, that to remember that the star ratings are lineal so seven to 
um, up jumped up from seven is, is am I right in thinking that's a quarter um, reduced energy? I think about so you know some people think oh it's just one more star rating on top of six but it actually represents significant change. Um, well, my only yeah. criticism or the thing to keep in mind um, with the increased star rating is that it is climate specific. So you know in Canberra it's much harder to get a seven or eight you know a high rating than it is in a mild climate. And to put that in context, um, just for pure theory and hypothetical fun, we've modeled some of sorry we again lighthouse had modeled some <laughs> of our um eight star houses in you know milder, milder climate sydney brisbane and they they come out more at like nine nine and a half yeah. so it, it does um you do have to to keep that you in context work harder yeah yeah work harder and, in, in more extreme yeah. climate Yep. And we just need to remember that it's a, it's a great tool for the the one bit that it does. So we still need to add that thinking about appliances on top of that and house size on top of that. And then there's going to be a discussion about embodied energy on top of that. Um, Dick mentioned some of the things happening in New South Wales looking at that and Victoria is also looking at the scorecard, um, which combines NatHERS with some of those other things. So I think the important message is is um, is that it's it is great. It's a great step in the right direction, but also understand the other things that you consider in the the whole of house. Mm. And so for people who up, the scorecard with its whole of house approach and so on, you know, this now brings in things like hot water system and, and lighting and and other appliances and built-in yeah. systems that need to be worked out. Yeah. But still going back to what I had mentioned earlier, the, the big problem is still that there are no compliance checks in place. So it's still all theoretical, you know, on paper. So that's the big thing, you know, where whatever, where, where designers or, you know, um, people who want to build a home have to be mindful with. Yeah, and the, and the project home builders that are really struggling with it, it there's, there's sort of, there are some loopholes that they can sort of get through. So don't don't assume that if you're just going out and getting an off the shelf house these days that it it is seven stars. Um, and the, the other thing I would love to see added is a point of sale um, in the ACT. For years they've had mm. star ratings at point of sale, um, and it's been fantastic because everyone in the ACT understands star ratings and it's really valued and it's driving market change. And I'd so love to see that brought in in the rest of Australia. Mm. Long over to you. I think so when totally, I came to Australia, I started working. They were talking about it, you know, I want 2010, and we still yeah, have it. Long time ago, yeah. still the and I should say they don't have to meet a minimum. There's no requirement. <laughs> it's purely then a market-based. Has um, to be disclosed. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just disclosure. So Julie would like to know for people that aren't um, getting a custom house design, um, what can people who are using a volume builder on a typical narrow lot do, or any volume builder really, to improve the thermal performance of their homes? And this does apply to an awful lot of people who can't afford mm, to it does. You know, or don't or choose not to, you know, go for a custom yep. design. Um, so I, look, I, I think being for for war, not forewarned, forearmed um, with with good information. So the sort of thing that you'll glean from um, Sanctuary magazine over the years and and from reading re, um, the Your Home technical manual uh, on the basics of passive design, installation, all the stuff we've been talking about today. And and just quiz the the uh, the builder the the salespeople, and and if they can't give you good answers, then move on. Hmm. And maybe even tell the builder, you know, that either yourself you're going to inspect the insulation, you know, go there and check it. Uh, and a friend of mine, you know, she's a, a single lady and was building her first house, so she was going with one of the cheaper volume builders. But I told her all those things. She watched some videos, and she actually went into the house herself, you know, checked the insulation told them where things were wrong. And she and her family actually went in with the foam insulation around the windows and fixed some of the gaps. So, you know, you, you can help mm -hmm. yourself and educate yourself and, you know, improve the performance of your house. Mm. I did um, coach some family members through this process. And, you know, the first was just really getting them to look at the floor plans, make sure they yeah. had that mainly living areas to the north. Make sure, as Simone said, make sure there's not then a big alfresco shading that. Mm -hmm. Pro, you know the volume builders are classic for north facing but then a big alfresco mm. over it and then you know some simple insulation upgrades if you can upgrading the windows if you can but not not forgetting the appliances you know if you can get a heat pump hot water system in there fantastic 
Um, and if if the house, this depends a little bit on the house, but if you can um, get it to the point where you can go with individual split systems rather than a big whole of house ducted system, um, that's also great. And, and ceiling fans. Hello. Oh, yes, ceiling fans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, dictator. Yeah. <laughs> um, Wayne makes the point that Passive House was developed in, in places where the climate has features long severe winters that focus on trapping and retaining heat for months at a time how do such houses cope with melbourne or adelaide for example where it's 40 degrees today 16 tomorrow and 32 the day after oh yep yep brilliant it's, it's kind of the same principles but we in australia we are fairly lucky in a sense that the climate is much milder so our walls can be much thinner than they would need to be in europe we can have much more glazing than the house would have been in, in denmark or you know in germany and many people might have seen those typical German or Europe, North European passive houses that are quite compact and have small windows. So we're quite lucky here. We don't need this. Houses are still fairly similar to, you know, to all the other houses here. You don't see really much the difference. Um, but they just perform perfectly in all climates. You know, our milder climates here in, in Melbourne or Victoria, but even perfectly in the tropics, you know, Northern Queensland. And I think there's a bit of a myth that you, if, you're, if you're living in a passive house, then it's a sealed box and you can't open the windows, which is not uh, um, right. That, that's the biggest myth we have to deal with. People say, but I don't want to live in an esky. <laughs> There's you no can... law against you opening the windows and doors anytime you like. You can <laughs> you just you don't have to. All the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we're lucky we moved into our own passive house three months ago and it's been really lovely, but we actually didn't put on fly screens yet. So I open the windows quite often, but then, you know, if the weather is nice, but then I have flies straight away coming up and, hmm, okay, so that's the <laughs> one thing I still need. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So this is something we haven't touched on. There's, um, Sharon says there's lots of discussion about insulating roofs or ceilings. Uh, what's the best roof material and colour to minimise heat oh. radiation? <laughs> Another bit of a can of worms, I know. Who wants yeah. to talk to me about roof colour? Well, look, yeah. the, um, <laughs> University of Newcastle built six little boxes, uh, six metres square, with different roof color, roof types and, and wall constructions and colors and, and all sorts of things. And they put 105 sensors in each little box and they ran them for a number of years. And, and it didn't please us in those of us who, who, you know, subscribe to certain dogmas in this design industry. The results of that test didn't please us because it showed that color was less important than insulation value, but it didn't show that color was of no use either. You know, so yes, roof color has an effect. It is not as important as the insulation inside the roof. It's, that's yeah. still number one primo, but it is still going to have an effect. And the other thing that it does affect is the when you get a whole lot of dark colored roofs together in an urban environment, as you build mm -hmm. up the, the urban heat island, and that is a big negative. So there yeah. are reasons to have light colored reflective roofs. So what's the yeah, urban heat island, Dick? The urban heat island is is what happens um, where a, a large urban area starts to increase its local heat as compared to an undeveloped area in in exactly the same climate zone, and and you can pick it straight away. Just go and stand outside in the western suburbs of Sydney or Melbourne on a thirty plus degree day, and and then just see what the temperature there is compared to um you know somewhere on in melbourne say on a little bit further on the other side of tullamarine and and there'll be a two to three to four degree difference in temperature and it's all down to the heat island yeah people get really passionate about roof color um <laughs> it is as dick said it's a little bit of an elephant in the room and to mm. speak from the canberra climate um we've done houses of all roof colors or you know all perform excellently and um with you know even on urban heat island if you're making that argument well then you should be doing a smaller house and planting a lot of great landscape around your house as well yeah. so i think my frustration is that, that it's seen as this um heralded as this um solution to everything when um the effect thermally is minimal actually in a cold climate um technically it makes a slight positive because in a cool climate we use way more energy heating than mm. we do cooling yeah. um but by the same token we would never 
push people one way or the other because there's all the all sorts of um, uh, different reasons, like the urban heat island effect, like aesthetics. Um, but mm. the you know the main point is to pay attention to all the the other bigger, more important ticket items that we've spoken about today. I mean, you really want your insulation to be a very effective barrier between the roof space and the inside of your house, anyway, right? So yeah. Yeah. hopefully, the uh, yeah. temperature of your roof space and, is not going to matter too much. The same goes, Anna, for um, a lot of people get really passionate about whirly birds and venting yeah. the roof as well. Um, and it's, just, it's you know, it's it's sort of the same part and parcel a little bit. And the bottom line is you're not living in your roof. You're living in your <laughs> house. Yeah. And there is good insulation and a good air leakage layer between um, your roof and your house. And um, uh, certainly in Canberra's climate, we strongly discourage anything that's creating extra drafts in your roof because you you know then you're creating extra pressure and then you're just exacerbating any leaks that you have up from the house and um we did yeah. a case study of a house um did a, a, quite a lot of temperature measurement before installation of whirlybirds and then the roof was painted a reflective color and whirlybirds were whirlybirds were added and we measured afterwards and uh it made a, a slight difference to the temperature inside the roof space it was an indetectable difference inside the house Oh, I need that research, Dick, so I can send it to people. Where do I find that? <laughs> <laughs> and what climate was that? That was Sydney, um, yeah, yeah. coastal Sydney. I really need that research. I'll email you after this. <laughs> What's quite interesting, in, in, in Germany, you know, they have much stricter uh, rules about insulation and how you have to insulate. So in Germany, actually, you have to insulate the roof level. Like, you know, in Australia, many mm. places, you know, you just yeah, have to insulation difference. on the ceiling level. Yeah. So in Germany, actually, you have to insulate the roof and the ceiling so that you, the roof space just can't get as hot in the first place. Mm. Um, you know, that's something else people can consider as well if they want to make sure it doesn't get too hot. So um, Gavin would like to know, how confident are you, panel panellists, that there are builders and tradies, at least in our capital cities, that can do passive solar and or passive house buildings? Oh, yeah. The lack of yeah. skilled builders a problem. Oh, they're yeah. getting more and more. There is a big uh, development and movement with Builders Declare. I think they're really, really active and educating lots of builders. And what I Builders find... Declare, Simone? So, so Builders Declare is, you know, a, a group of builders, you know, really passionate about their built environment. And they just got together and pretty much put their foot down and said, you know, we have to build better homes. Um, and they, you know, have really strong ethics and, you know, really great an education um, about, you know, low energy efficient homes and how to build better. And, you know, they're educating a lot. They're talking a lot with builders and, uh, you know, they're, they're getting bigger and bigger with the movement. You know, many more builders are coming on board. So I would almost say, you know, if someone is looking for a builder, maybe even checking you know, out their list, a builder who's listed on their website, you know, might be a good point on starting, you know, with, who is actually interested in the space. Yeah. Can uh, Yeah. Can I um, shout from the rooftop there? We, we do a lot of builder bashing. <laughs> Um, when we talk about energy efficiency but at the other end of the spectrum of course there are fantastic builders and tradespeople. Yeah, yeah. they build our houses it's not like we're bashing them over the head to do it you know yeah. most of the builders that we work with love this stuff just as much as us come mm. back to us with solutions and alternatives um, yes just like um, you know designers just like anyone you work with um, it's just up to mm. you to to work out who who's good and who's aligned to what you want to do yeah and what i think as well is you know if you find a builder and it might even a builder who has never done a high performing home or energy efficient home but the important thing is that they're really keen they're eager mm. they want to learn they want to do it because often you know builders are looking for their chance to get into this market yeah. and if you have someone who's really keen and willing you know give give them a go yeah we, we've found a number of builders that have come on board with us um who started out saying oh you know i've heard about this this environmental building stuff I don't know much about it. And we say, well, can you read plans and follow a space? And they yeah. go, yeah, well, then you know, that's all you need. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that, that's just where it's all, yeah, it, it's easy. It's not that hard. Um, yeah. And we've made some great relationships with builders starting guess, out exactly yeah, that way. I guess that the one tricky thing can be sometimes when you have a, an established business, an old builder that has done things 20, 30, 40 years, always the same, and they don't want to change. That can be challenging, you know, if you have someone with that mindset, but as long as you have someone willing to change and adapt, you know, perfect. And if you have that less experienced builder, that's an even stronger case for doing some of that post-build testing. So that's where you, you might be that extra case to do an air leakage test and some thermal imaging. Um, and, uh, you know, Lighthouse do that with 
all of their projects um, and I'm doing it with all of mine now to get that feedback loop. Um, and then the builders can really see the difference in um, little approaches. You know, there's things that often um, won't be captured in a, um, a, a, a most design specs. A good example is um, internal cavity sliding doors, notoriously leaky because they, they just open up to a cavity inside the house. Um, but you know, when you, when you become experienced with that and you're testing that built construction and you realize that as an issue, um, you know, all the builders I've worked with in the past, whether they're building our projects or now projects for other people, um, they will, will wrap that, um, cavity because they, they've had that feedback. So, so those are Something great tools. Much, one thing that's much easier to do in the build process rather than later. <laughs> Yeah, and often, again, sometimes the really experienced builders who have been addressing air leakage for a long time, again, there's sometimes some things that come up or they don't realise a certain trade left a certain hole and the yeah. value in finding that that one big hole, you know, behind the oven or the where the washing machine's going to be installed will make a big difference over 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just put a, a link in the in the chat to an article that actually Jenny Edwards from Lighthouse wrote for Sanctuary a couple a few years back now on how to choose uh, on green builders and how to choose the right person to construct your home. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a couple of years old now, but I'm sure all of the points in there are still very relevant. Uh, but yeah, the takeaway there is for all the professionals that you want to work with, um, be be that designers and architects or builders or energy raters or whatever, make sure you find people who are on your wavelength um subscribe to the same values that you do or at the very least are prepared to learn <laughs> um, and everyone can claim sustainability these days i don't know yeah, a builder exactly. or a designer really... that doesn't say they do sustainability so you need to be a little bit sort of switched on yeah. and critical about that yeah i was just saying a fun question what i think you can do is well you know being a, your designer architect or or builder, you know, what they have done or, you know, uh, yeah. on sustainable projects. And I think if someone said, oh, we've done this really energy efficient six star home, you know, that should already be some warning <laughs> bells because six star is the minimum standard. And if they talk about whatever that they put on, whatever, a, a rainwater tank and maybe some solar hot water, then, you know, they're clearly not your person. Yeah. Yeah. They, they should be talking about how they put in better insulation or what techniques they use to whatever improve something. Um, yeah. You know, that, that's the things you should listen out for. Yeah. Nick, you would like to know at what stage do you do your air leakage testing, Sarah? Lock up mm. and completion. Yes. Lock up, yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, the, find... I'll vary a little bit there. Maybe, so Simone, do you want to talk about why you do it for at lock up for yeah, passive the, house? With a passive house, lock up is the stage where you can actually look for mistakes or, you know, for, for leakage, you know, if there were gaps somewhere. Uh, once you've finished off the house, your plaster board and everything is on, it's really hard to find those gaps or those leakages. And then you do it once the house is finished. Yeah. And then so a key difference with the way um, I would normally work is uh, my focus is always getting the air leakage addressed at that plasterboard um, layer, uh, mm -hmm. not having the – so Passive House has the sort of additional um, internal membrane wrap and cavity um, uh, to get that very high level of air leakage. So that's why you do the test where you can still see that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas all the projects I've worked on, we, we wouldn't do that because we're focusing on air leakage at the plasterboard layer and it is still um, quite easy to, to fix little holes and gaps mm -hmm. at the end of the project. So you're only doing that test at the end to, to check the levels. Yeah. Cool. Um, we are getting to the end of our time, folks, unbelievably. Um, I've, got, I've just got one final question, which is from Felicity, um, who would like to know, do you see the cost for building a sustainable home becoming more affordable? Yeah. And, and we're, we're seeing we're, it. We're continually grappling with, isn't it? Um, yeah. And I guess we're all more affordable relative to an average, not particularly yeah. sustainable home, because, yeah. you know, we all know that costs are going up for everyone. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, so, we, we've seen it with, with glazing as well, you know, like, when we renovated our place in 2010, double glazed windows or good ones were just unaffordable. So we imported them from overseas, but now the prices have come down. So there are more and more materials that are get, getting more comparable to standard products. It's still a bit more, but you know, the more demand there is, the more people will, companies will be on the market and the more closer, you know, high performing elements and standard elements will be getting. Yeah. 
Mm. Mm. The case study I mentioned at the start with the the better quality windows essentially evening out in price over time, um, that's in the context of the windows are usually one of the biggest ticket items in an upgraded house. Um, and I would say that it's it's very affordable because you can get things like the design right. You can design it well and save space. You know, those things cost nothing. Like Dick Clark said, yeah. lines cost nothing, nothing on the page. Mm. Um, the, the thing is that often when people are doing an energy efficient house and coming to us as designer, they're also asking for other upgrades um, and special things. So um, unfortunately, the end price on a high performance home is also reflecting a lot of those other quality and aesthetic elements but you know there's absolutely no reason you can't do some quite affordable changes to your average project home um, and you know then with a pretty modest pv system get it to net zero so i mean the, all of the um during my time at lighthouse um and up till now over the last decade probably worked on a couple of hundred houses um all a lot of which um have t been tested and tracked and in the Canberra climate, um, we found the best sweet spot was aiming for about eight stars at the moment. Um, beyond that, you're starting to um, invest, invest a lot um, for less thermal benefit. And once you're at eight stars, you can um, get to net zero with a, you know, a pretty standard um, PV system. Um, and then batteries are getting more and more affordable. So if it's, if it's purely about affordability and energy efficiency, that's the sort of the sweet spot I would aim for with also a focus on um, draft proofing. Yeah. Mona Dick, any last words? Oh, just uh, in, in conventional or non-passive house um, construction. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Sort of eight, eight, eight and a half may, max maybe is is the sweet spot. Mm. Uh, and PV is so relatively cheap now. Yeah. Um, but but keeping in mind that kind of ceiling fan, aircon thing, <laughs> and you know, is is a really neat way to to get the comfort oh. levels to mm. uh, a very high level. But um, it it's still we're still left with this gap between what the project home industry can provide, which on the face of it looks like a very good value proposition and what the custom design, custom build system provides. And we're bridging that gap is the challenge we're continually working on. And there are um, some tentative efforts being made to bridge that gap. There is you know, a couple of companies, one in Melbourne um, that we're working with, and I know there are others that are, starting to to get um, houses at a you know very high performance level at very affordable levels but they are also very efficient space wise and and that's one of the the disciplines that has to be applied that you don't have waste space you don't have silly mm. rooms that no one uses mm. um, you know the formal dining room the media room etc so provided people are happy to step outside of those requirements, then mm -hmm. I think we're beginning to see a bridge across that chasm that, that hasn't been there before. Simone, final thoughts? Oh, yeah, I think it's well, you know, people, uh, like we said before, people need to get educated, you know, be, be clear on what you need, what you want and what you need, like, like Sarah had said, you know, on, on your needs and wants. Uh, be educated and, you know, try to find a good team. I think the important thing is, you know, right from the start, find a good designer architect, a good builder, or if you're going with a volume builder, at least make sure that they're willing to listen and help you improve the house. So you, you need a good team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, that's all we've got time for tonight. Thank you very much, Sarah, Dick and Simone for sharing your time and expertise. And thank you to all of our attendees for tuning into this Sustainable House Day session and for all your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Thank you very much for your enthusiasm. Uh, there are two more sessions in this series, so please visit the Sustainable House Day website to check out the details and register if you'd like to tune in, as well as checking out our other events coming up. You can buy tickets for individual events or discounted series passes. And we've also introduced an annual pass for all Sustainable House Day events which means each event costs around only around $3. Don't forget, members of Renew receive free or discounted tickets, and we always have an allocation of free places for those in financial difficulty. And a quick plug from me for Sanctuary. If you're not already a subscriber, or if you have someone in your life who'd just love reading about sustainable design four times a year, we'd love it if you jump online at sanctuary.renew.org.au and sign up or gift a subscription. The best magazine in the world. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah.
<laughs> Thank you again, everybody, and good night.